supply and wastewater never meet. So we've gone through all kinds of plumbing acrobatics over the decades to make sure that the wastewater from your building doesn't contaminate the water supply that we all share. One of the ways we do it is really quite simple. It's an air gap between the, the faucet and any kind of basin. So that air gap makes sure that if the basin backs up, the faucet isn't buried in the water and therefore won't be an opportunity to siphon dirty water back into our municipal supply. We've come a long way, and cholera is something that we just don't really see anymore. And that's pretty remarkable. I mean, the thing about plumbing is the more I study it, the less interesting it is, but the more fascinating it is to me that we actually pulled this off because it's an amazing feat. And when you see that, you know, at the end of the last century, at the end of the 2000s, uh, sorry, the end of the, you know, end of the 19, you know, 1999 at the, near New Year's, I saw all kinds of greatest accomplishments of the 20th century and greatest engineering achievements and so forth. And plumbing was always really high up, usually like second or third. I mean, it was often above computing and above aircraft and above automobiles, telephones, all kinds of things that we think of as being, frankly, a little bit more technologically important. But just providing clean drinking water to our buildings and then being able to get wastewater away from our buildings in a sanitary way, that's a really big deal. The second way we do that is with what's called a backflow preventer. There are several different flavors of backflow preventer, but one of them is called a vacuum breaker, and that's what you see here in the middle image. It's a, In this case, it's a toilet. So what happens is, and I'll show you an example in a little bit, the way a backflow preventer works is the water moves one way, the way it's supposed to run, and everything works fine. Should water back up, should there be a siphon that may take unsanitary water back to our supply system, then instead of uh, pulling from the water, a little, uh, little kind of mechanism makes it so that air fills the pipe. So water moves one way, but if it backs up, the water isn't allowed to move and air enters the system and, uh, and allows the siphon to, to draw air instead of water. Where this might be a problem is, well, say there's, you know, the fire department might um, often, usually, almost always, uses the same supply system that buildings use. So if there's, a, say, a fire in the neighborhood, you wouldn't want a condition where the fire department is using the hoses and it's creating a negative pressure in everything, and it's actually trying to suck back. We don't want that. We don't want a situation where, for instance, a hose has been used to fill a baby pool. The baby pool has been sitting there for three weeks because you went on vacation, forgetting about it. And now the hose is in the algae-filled baby pool water. If there's a fire in the neighborhood, we don't want a negative pressure on the supply line that would actually suck the uh, algae-filled water back through the supply system. We'd rather not have that. So that's why we use something like a vacuum breaker. This is a good time to introduce types of valves. We have a gate valve. We have a globe valve, and we have a check valve. Each serves a specific purpose, and frankly, these are kind of old-fashioned names for them. They've since been superseded. The gate valve looks like a gate. When it screws down into the shutoff position, it pretty much shuts everything off. And when it opens up, it, you see it kind of stays out of the way and doesn't add a lot of friction to the system. We use gate valves, we engage gate valves if we want to do maintenance on the system. So there may be one for the whole building, and there's probably also one for each of the appliances inside the building. We can shut off the gate valve to, say, our dishwasher, and then we can do maintenance to our dishwasher. Or we can shut off the gate valve to, say, our entire building, and then we can do maintenance to the entire building. Now, the glow valve is kind of the opposite. The gate valve is not made to be used all the time. It's not made to be a particularly comfortable mode of turning on and off the water, and you have to turn and turn and turn as this gate screws in and to engage and screws out to retract. The globe valve is a bit different. The globe valve is what we might use for, say, a faucet. In the case of the globe valve, if you look at it, you can see as water moves through it, there's quite a lot of friction. But it's made for repeated use, and it's made to be comfortable. It's made so you don't have to unscrew it too many times to open it up. And we're not too worried about the extra friction because it's like a faucet where it's only really at the end of the line for one particular fixture. A gate valve may be in line for the entire building, so we wouldn't want it to create a lot of friction downstream. The third type of valve is called a check valve. A check valve is a backflow preventer much like the vacuum breaker. 
And you can see the water is allowed to move one direction, but not the other. And often what happens is right when the water moves into the building, there's a check valve. And that check valve is required by code because it wants to make sure that if for some reason there was a siphon, it's one more way to make sure that we're not contaminating from our building the water supply for the other, the other people in the municipality. Let's go ahead and do number 36. Number 36 reads, a water tank is 75 feet above a fixture. What will the pressure be at the fixture? You may ignore losses from friction for this exercise. And we're given a formula that pressure is equal to 0 0.433 times height. Go ahead and hit pause. All right, um, let's go over number 36. In a municipality, here's how it generally works. We have a reservoir. We have a water tower. We have a pump that takes water up to the water tower and it holds it in the water tower and the water tower is often on top of the hill. Then somewhere else lower than the water tower we have our building and we have a fixture. In this case the fixture is 75 feet below the top of the water and water seeks its own level. The amount of pressure in the fixture is a function of the height of the water above the fixture. The higher the water the more the pressure. 